I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. To the weak, but can't find that quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature, that Lydia Street. Walk with the Prince of Peace. Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about the coagulation cascade. In addition, we'll talk about the medications that also affect the factors in the coagulation cascade. Here is a diagram of both intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways of the coagulation cascade. It's a very complicated diagram, but you can pause here, review it very quickly, and just look at the different features. But we'll break down this diagram into more simplistic form. That way it's easier to remember for you. So really, you can break down the coagulation cascade into an extrinsic pathway, an intrinsic pathway, and a common pathway. The extrinsic pathway is activated by vessel wall damage. The cells that are involved release a tissue factor. This tissue factor results in binding of factor 7A and the eventual activation of factor 10. The intrinsic pathway involves factor 12, otherwise known as the Hagman factor, precalacrian, and high molecular weight kininogen. A negative charge, termed the inorganic polyphosphate molecule, is released by damaged cells. And this poly P, as it is otherwise known, activates factor 12, the precalacrin, as well as the high molecular weight kininogen, activating the intrinsic pathway. Both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway eventually lead to factor 10 activation. Factor 10 activation leads to the common pathway. Within the common pathway, you have factor 5, prothrombin conversion to thrombin, and fibrinogen conversion to fibrin. This consists of the entire coagulation cascade. Now, as a result of these different pathways, extrinsic, intrinsic, and finally the common pathway, we have developed laboratory tests that can identify each portion of the pathway. So these tests include one, your PT, two, your INR, and three, your PTT. PT stands for your prothrombin time. INR is the international normalized ratio. And finally, PTT is your partial thromboblastin time. Keep in mind, your INR is a form of a PT, but it differs in the sense that the normal ratio or the normal values for an INR have been agreed on across the world among all labs, while the PT can vary from lab to lab and from hospital to hospital. So how does this measure our pathways? Well, your PT measures your extrinsic pathway. You can think of it like the extrinsic pathway is a very short pathway, so it actually takes the test with the sh shortest name. The intrinsic pathway is measured by your PTT. Again, intrinsic is actually the longer pathway, with the most factors, so it uses the test that uh, has the longest name. And then finally, your common pathway is generally measured by your INR. Using these tests, you can determine defects in the pathway, such as if you have hemophilia A and hemophilia B, you may see an alteration in these tests. We'll talk about how to interpret PT, PTT, and INR in another video. But let's talk about the classic anticoagulants we use in the hospital. So number one would be unfractionated heparin. So unfractionated heparin, inhibits thrombin and 10A. It's generally administered via continuous drip, but you can give it via sub-Q for prophylaxis against DVTs, or deep venous thromboses. Realize the use of unfractionated heparin has an increased risk of developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Enoxaparin, otherwise known as Lovenox, is generally dosed twice or once a day, and it's given subcutaneously. Note that we commonly use enoxaparin for either prophylaxis for DVTs and PEs or for therapy. So if someone has a DVT and PE for therapeutic use. There's a very big difference between unfractionated heparin and enoxaparin. One would be that there's a decreased risk of hit heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with enoxaparin. And in addition, 
There has been noted improved morbidity and mortality in cancer patients who are treated with anoxaparin for DVT and PEs as compared to Coumadin or Warfarin. Now that brings us to Warfarin, otherwise known as Coumadin, which is a oral vitamin K antagonist. So it, it inhibits factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, and protein S. Now Warfarin requires bridging when initiated because of its effect on protein C and protein S, patients actually become prothrombotic, meaning they tend to form clots when initially started on Coumadin. Patients who are on Coumadin need to be monitored with an INR, and their goals depend on why they're being treated. The problem with Coumadin is that, is that it's affected by many things, so including diet as well as medication. So from eating leafy vegetables, to taking an oral vitamin, to starting antibiotics, all these things will affect the amount of Coumadin you need. So it requires very close monitoring, especially when you're on other medications, and it requires very frequent monitoring with INRs. The one plus side is that Coumadin is very cheap. So for patients, it's very inexpensive to get. Now, we have our classic anticoagulants that we've been using for years. But now, there are actually new anticoagulant agents that we can use to treat people for both DVTP and including atrial fibrillation for prophylaxis for stroke. Some of these include rivaroxaban and dabigatran. So rivaroxaban is an orally administered drug. It's a factor 10A inhibitor. You do not need any monitoring. It has a relatively short half-life. But the problem with it is that there's no good reversal agent. So if someone starts bleeding on it, you just kind of have to let them trend down and just not give them their medication. Dabigatran, also known as Pradaxa, is also orally administered. It's a direct thrombin inhibitor. No monitoring is needed. And again, it has a short half-life. But again, there's also no good reversal agent. So if someone's bleeding on it, you just don't give them their medication and let them trend down. Now, this is a brief review of kind of the coagulation cascade and medications associated with coagulation cascade. If you like this video, give it a like. If you have any questions or any comments or suggestions for even future videos, place them down below. Make sure to share this video with your friends on both Facebook as well as Twitter. And most importantly, subscribe. It's Dr. K from my medical school, and I'll see you next time.